please keep these families in your prayers. Uh, our 14th annual Wednesday Summer Series will meet this week at 7 p.m. Dan Baum will present a lesson on the book of Zechariah. This year's theme is the Minor Prophets. The evangelism group led by Ken Spear will meet this evening in the library after worship. The men who are to serve this evening, the lesson will be given by Ken Hope. Song service will be led by Eric Rucker. Opening prayer by Sean McKinney. Scripture reading, Caleb March. If you'd like to follow along, that scripture is 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. And at the appropriate time, we'll have a closing prayer by Glenn Mayberry. Now let's put away the thoughts of the world and open the service with a prayer. Good afternoon. Let's go to our Holy Father in prayer. Holy God, our Creator and our Father in Heaven, we come to you thankful for this day and this time that we have to come together that we may worship and praise you as well as to remember your Son. We are thankful, Father, for this opportunity we may come together. We pray to you, Father, that as we may enter into this worship that it may be pleasing to you. Of course, Father, we're mindful that you are our Creator and our Father, and we're so thankful, Father, for the many blessings you've given us in this life. And most of all, though, your Son and his willingness to die on that cruel cross for us, we pray to you continue to be with us and guide us, and when we do fall short, Father, when we do sin, you may forgive us of those sins. Father, we're also mindful of those among us who may be sick, our shut-ins, those who are grieving over the loss of loved ones. We pray to you comfort, protect, and encourage them as only you can. And Father, now as we enter into this worship, we pray you be with us once again as we give you all the praise and all the glory, and it's in your Son's holy name we offer this prayer. Amen. As now, I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, or effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves or covetous, nor drunkards or revealers, nor extortioners shall enter the kingdom of God. And such of you that ye are washed, will ye, ye will be sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. As you can see, the first song this uh, evening is number 100. And eleven, one, one, one. Marching to Zion. We'll sing all four verses. <clears throat>
and fourth verses. Next song will be number 761, Where He Leads I'll Follow. By the way, all of these songs are meant to be around the topic of being a Christian and a disciple and following after Christ and overcoming temptation. 761.
Next song will be 894, 894. That's probably where I learned it. And I believe the tune's somewhat like This Land is Your Land, if you know that. This is an American folk melody. Song before the Lord's Supper will be number 330. 330. Ask after this song that the men will come down that are going to serve the table.
The table has been left for prepared for those who are unable to take this morning. If you will raise your hand as we pass by, we'll be happy to serve you. Shall we pray? Our Father and God in heaven, we thank you for this bread that represents your son's body on the cross. We pray that you will be with us as we partake and help us to do in a manner pleasing to you, remembering why your son died on the cross and remembering that scene of him on the cross to remember his death and how special it is. Be with us now. This we ask in your son's name. Amen. Bow as we bless the cup. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day that you blessed us with to gather around your table once again to remember the sacrifice that your son made for us, dear Lord. And we pray that you rest this cup that represents Christ's blood. Be with the ones that partake of this and pray that they take it in a worthy manner, dear Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Dear God in heaven, we're deep grateful for your many blessings. We're thankful for the love that you show for us and for your son. We pray, dear God, now as we give back to you, that you would bless these funds, that they may help spread your word throughout this city and state and nation. We pray, dear Lord, that you would be with us, strengthen us, help us to give with a cheerful heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
you're using your books, you can mark number 768. That'll be the song after the lesson tonight. 768, while we pray and while we plead. And then the song before the lesson will be number 599. If you will, uh, please stand if you're able. This evening, we're getting right into our study. You remember on Sunday evenings, we've been looking at a series entitled Besetting Sins. And what we've been specifically looking at for the last three weeks, tonight the fourth, is the topic, the subject of homosexuality. Now, regarding this subject, or really any other subject, we have three choices regarding what we're going to do in the preaching of this. The first, I want you to notice this, we can be silent. We can simply keep quiet. You remember in Job 40 and verse 4, Job said, I lay my hand on my mouth. Now he wasn't talking about preaching the truth. He was talking about the foolish words that he himself had spoken without knowledge. But this is a choice that we could take. We could just simply say, I'm going to cover my mouth. I'm not going to say anything. Nothing by way of favor, nothing by way of condemnation. Well, remember what man has said? Sometimes silence is golden, but sometimes it's downright yellow. And I think that's exactly what we would be if we, as the Lord's church, refuse to say anything upon this subject or any other subject. You remember in Jeremiah 4 and verse 19, prompted by the spirit of all the prophets, Jeremiah said, I cannot keep silent. And so really we have to dismiss this choice, this option, just to keep silent. But there's another choice. 
We could speak out in favor, in defense of homosexuality. That's what a lot of people are doing right now. It seems like as a nation we are rushing to justify, and not only justify, but to exalt this sin. Well, once again, in keeping with this possibility to speak in favor, the reality is if we were to speak in favor of homosexuality, we would be calling God a liar because he condemns this practice. To him, as we've already studied together, it is an abomination. I want you to take your Bibles, look at what Solomon writes in Proverbs, in the book of Proverbs, chapter 17, specifically verse 15, and listen to this verse in connection to what we just said speaking out in favor in defense of homosexuality. Well, notice what Solomon writes. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the just, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. To justify the wicked is an abomination before God. And so really the only choice that we have, biblically speaking, if we're going to try to please God, is to speak out to expose and rebuke homosexuality. Now as we do this, remember Ephesians 4.15, we want to speak the truth in love. It's interesting, Paul says that in chapter 4 and verse 15, speaking the truth in love. One chapter later in Ephesians 5 and verse 11, he says, have, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. And so we are to speak the truth, and we are to speak it in love. But we're not to participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness. It is our work, our job to expose them. Let's keep this in mind. We're not trying to please mankind. We're trying to save humanity. And I'm not talking about anything that we do. Jesus is our Savior. But my point is the gospel is God's power unto salvation, Romans 1 and verse 16. And if we're not going to let people hear the soul-saving message, then no, they will not be saved. So in that vein, we're not trying to please humanity. We want humanity to be saved. So we want them to hear the truth. Well, this is what we've been dealing with, homosexuality, acceptable or abomination. And of course, we've been looking at the section, the truth about homosexuality. We've already dealt with four scriptures in the Bible that explicitly speak regarding homosexuality, and all four of them condemn this sin. In Leviticus 18 and verse 22, it is referred to as an abomination. In Leviticus 20 and verse 13, likewise, it is referred to as an abomination. In Romans, the first chapter, verses 26 and 27, it is called against nature. It is unnatural, it is unholy. And of course, the last one we looked at in 1 Timothy 1, verses 8 through 10. It is practiced by those who are lawless. Read the context. Sin is lawlessness. 1 John 3 and verse 4. Well, tonight we're going to look at the last context, the last passage the fifth one, it's in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. Caleb has just read this for us, but let's go back and look at this again. And then we'll do what we have done. After we read this together, we're going to make some very simple, straightforward points. And then the lesson will be yours. This entire series will be yours. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, beginning in verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. 
and such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now, again, this language is very straightforward. You cannot misunderstand it unless you want to misunderstand it. As I've mentioned in the last two Sunday evenings, these contexts, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11 now, these stand without refutation. Again, people do try to refute what God has said here, but not successfully. They cannot because God has made it so plain. Well, here's one of the points we get from this context. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, remember, Paul in this context states, do not be deceived. This is one of the things that Paul does not want the brethren in Corinth to be deceived regarding. There were those, obviously, in Paul's day, there are those in our day that would have us believe that the unrighteous can. They do. They will inherit the kingdom of God. But don't be deceived regarding what man says. The Bible plainly teaches the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now think about this. The kingdom of God the kingdom of heaven, those terms are used synonymously with the church of our Lord. That's what Paul is pressing here, that the unrighteous are not going to be members of the body of Christ. Remember the previous chapter? Remove that wicked man from among yourself. He has no place in the body of Christ. He has no place in the church of our Lord. Now, listen to this. I know, I know that there is a sense, because of Romans 3 and verse 10, there is none righteous, no, not one. Well, somebody might say, well, if the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God, if they cannot be members of the church, then no one can be, because there is none righteous, well, that's part of what the Bible is teaching us. That yes, we are unrighteous because of sin, but how can we become righteous? How can we inherit the kingdom of God? Do you remember also the Bible teaches in Luke the fifth chapter, verses 31 and 32. Jesus said, I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, when Jesus said that, he was not implying that there were those who were righteous. His whole point was, I came to call sinners. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of God's glory, Romans 3 and verse 23. But his point to the Jews was very simple. You think you're righteous. And so I didn't come to call you. I don't have anything to say to you. I can't help you. This is the context, Luke 5, where they want to know, why is Jesus eating with tax collectors? Why is he eating with sinners? And Jesus, in his explanation, is trying to inform them why. Because they, they didn't think they needed Jesus. They didn't think they needed a physician. They thought they were already righteous. And so Jesus' point is, as the great physician looking for someone to heal, I'm going to be where those people know that they're sick. They know that they stand in need of a Savior. Again, the Bible teaches us in Matthew 5 and verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now notice this. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The unrighteous who will not repent, who will not become righteous in Christ, they cannot inherit the kingdom. But for the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When somebody realizes that I am poverty stricken, that I am bankrupt before God, 
that I need Jesus as a Savior, that's the only person that can inherit the kingdom because that's the only person that thinks they need help. That's the only person that understands they've sinned, they're unrighteous before God. Isn't it interesting in Matthew 5 and verse 4, the very next verse goes on to tell us, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. You see, they realize they're poor in spirit, they realize they've sinned, they mourn over that fact. God says that's the one that's going to be comforted. But as we look at this context, Paul says the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. And once again, let's not be deceived about that. We have to come before our God in all of our unrighteousness, and we have to say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Luke 18 and verse 13. You remember what the Bible teaches in 1 Peter 3 and verse 18? The just died for the unjust. That's us. We're unjust. But the just, Jesus, the Holy One, He died for the unjust. Again, let's look at another point from this context. Homosexuals are listed among the unrighteous. Put these two points together. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. And remember Paul saying, don't be deceived. Don't let anyone deceive you about this. Well, if the unrighteous cannot inherit the kingdom of God and if homosexuals are listed among the unrighteous, what's the logical conclusion? While still in that sin, no. They cannot become members of the body of Christ. Their sins cannot be forgiven if they will not repent of those sins. And so let's look at this again. Take your Bibles. Go with me once again to 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter. I want us to read what it says once again because notice who's listed among the unrighteous. All of these that Paul is calling, he's calling them by their sin. Notice he's saying they can't inherit the kingdom of God. Look at verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 6. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Language, again, is very plain here. And so what are the two points that we learn here that we're not to be deceived regarding? The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God, and homosexuals are listed among the unrighteous. But there is another truth wonderfully embedded in this context that we must not be deceived about either. And here it is. Homosexuals can forsake this sin and be forgiven. The sin of homosexuality can be forgiven. This context proves it. Look at verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 6. After saying, don't be deceived about this, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God, and don't be deceived that homosexuals are, are among the unrighteous, notice what Paul says in verse 11. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of of our God. Obviously, some of the Corinthians had practiced this sin and the other sins listed. Such were past tense. They were these things, but they were washed. What does that mean? Remember what Ananias told Saul? Why do you delay? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling upon the name of the Lord. That's what the Corinthians 
had happened to them. That's what they participated in. A washing, a cleansing, baptism into Christ. Many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were being baptized. Acts 18 and verse 8. So they were washed, they were sanctified. Notice the term sanctified means set apart. The unrighteous cannot inherit the kingdom of God, but when we're baptized into Christ, what happens? We inherit the kingdom. We enter the church. Remember in Acts, the second chapter, in verse 40, after telling the audience to repent and let every one of them be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins, Peter and the others told them, save yourselves from this untoward generation and remember, those who gladly received the word were baptized, and there was added that day 3,000 souls. Well, in Acts 2 and verse 47, you see what they were added to, the church. Again, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom, but those who understand their sin, their unrighteousness, and come to Christ and are obedient to Him, they become righteous in Him. Their sins are forgiven. Turn with me to a context. In the book of Ezekiel, in Ezekiel, look if you will at chapter 18. We want to read the last three verses of this context. It's really beautiful language. We find here, among many truths, a reason why God pardons. What motivates him to forgive? What motivates him to pardon? Read this with me. Listen to this. In Ezekiel 18, beginning in verse 30, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent. Notice what he challenges would do. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, so that iniquity will not be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit, for why should you die, O house of Israel? Now listen to this. For I have no pleasure in the death of the one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore turn and live. There is the wonderful motivation behind God's forgiveness. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God doesn't delight when people live in sin and when they die in sin. He wants them to turn. He wants them to come to Him. He wants them to cast away all their transgressions. That's exactly what the Corinthians did. Such were some of you. Past tense. They were no longer these things. They had renounced these sins. They had confessed them. They had forsaken them. They're now members of the body of Christ. Well, under this thought, notice this, forgiven, they now become righteous. The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God, but those who are forgiven, those who have become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21 can and will become members of the body of Christ. Forgiven, they, are, they, are now, they now become righteous. Righteous, they can now be added to the church and labor in the kingdom. Now don't be deceived about this last truth. Again, sometimes we hear from the world, from that quarter, oh yes, the unrighteous can, will inherit the kingdom of God. And homosexuals are not listed among the unrighteous. Don't be deceived about that. But let's not ever be deceived into thinking that homosexuals cannot be forgiven. Our God is good. He is ready to forgive. Psalm 86 and verse 5. Now remember the language of Proverbs 28 and verse 13. If we conceal our transgressions, remember we're not going to prosper. 
But if we confess and forsake them, we will find compassion. It is demanded, commanded, not only of homosexuals, but for every sin that we have committed, that we must repent of that sin. Confess it, forsake it, that we might be part of our Lord's kingdom, His church. Do not be deceived. Well, I want you to notice something else. Faulty, flawed, and fatal arguments. I was going to leave it just looking at those five contexts. Now listen to this. I do believe with all of my being that knowing what the Bible teaches, that's what we need. Because all of the world's arguments are not going to change what the Bible teaches. But based upon that solid foundation laid by the Scripture, let me just very, very quickly show you a few of the arguments and just mention one or two things in relationship to these fatal, flawed, and faulty arguments. You know what's being said today, God made me like this. God created me a homosexual. There's nothing farther from the truth. If we believe what we've studied together from Leviticus to 1 Timothy, the first chapter, then we know that what they're saying simply is not so. Male and female created he them. Again, the language of Genesis 1 verses 26 and 27. And one last thing I'll say regarding this. Write down Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 29. Solomon destroys this foolish argument when he says, I have found only this. God has made man upright, but man has sought out many devices. God didn't create anyone a sinner. God didn't create anyone a homosexual. But we, humanity, have sought out many devices. That's the reality. Well, people are saying this. Jesus never spoke of homosexuality, so it must not be wrong. Some say it must not be any big deal. Jesus didn't speak of it. Well, there's a sense in which he didn't, he didn't use the terms that we've been talking about. But in Matthew 15 and verse 19, Jesus uses the term porneia. That is a general term covering all fornication, homosexuality included. So biblically, in reality, yes, Jesus did condemn that sin. He did have something to say about that sin. So this idea that God made me like this, that is blasphemous speech. Once again, remember what the one talent man said? I knew you were a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered no straw. I was afraid and I went and hid my talent. That is blasphemous speech. And what we're talking about here, that God made me like that, that's blasphemous well, this other thought, Jesus never spoke of homosexuality. Yes, he did. But you see, people are so ignorant of what the Bible teaches. They don't know that. And it sounds good to them to blame it on God. God made me like this. And also to bring our Lord in it. Jesus never spoke condemningly about homosexuality. Well, on both counts, they're wrong. Notice. Sodom was condemned for not being hospitable. I heard someone try to pass this argument off. That Sodom and Gomorrah, they were not destroyed for homosexuality, but they were destroyed for not being hospitable. Well, take your Bibles for just a moment. Go with me to Genesis 13. Genesis 13 Look, if you will, at verse 13. This is the first time Sodom is spoken of in these kind of terms. It says, But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked 
and sinful against the Lord. Notice that. The men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. Now, just reading that language, it doesn't sound like being inhospitable. But nevertheless, go with me to another verse. In chapter 18, look at verse 20. In chapter 18 and verse 20, it says, And the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, this is when God is explaining to Abraham what's going to happen, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Their sin is very grave. Well, we don't have time to read chapter 19, but the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, well documented, is the sin of homosexuality. Two angels came. They were going to stay in the square. Lot says, don't stay in the square. You don't want to do that. Come to my house. But the men, young and old, came that night. They wanted Lot to send those two men out so that they could have sex with him, so that they could have relations with them. Look at verse 5 if you don't believe it. It says, and they called to Lot and said to him, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. To know them. That's talking about sexual intimacy. Read at the end of Matthew 1 that Joseph did not know Mary until they were married. Well, it's talking about sexual intimacy. That's what Sodom and Gomorrah were consumed for. Do you remember in 2 Peter 2, in verse 6, Peter says, They are an example for others who will live ungodly hereafter. Jude says in verse 7 that their sin was they went after strange flesh. Remember what we've already said. Homosexuality is unnatural. It's not normal. It is against nature. And that's exactly what Jude confirms. But... Look, if you will, at Ezekiel, Ezekiel 16, because here's the verse that some go to that try to say, you know what, even though the Bible has all that to say about Sodom, they really were not condemned for homosexuality. Look at chapter 16, and specifically here, look, if you will, Ezekiel 16, look at verse 49. 49, it says, Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. Now, no one is saying that that's not part of their sin. Obviously, the Bible says it is. But to come to this context and to ignore everything else the Bible has to say about Sodom and Gomorrah is really foolishness. It's really not being fair with what the Bible teaches. Well, there's another argument. Homosexuality is a civil rights issue. That's what they're trying to make it. Homosexuality is not a civil rights issue. It is a moral wrong issue. That's what it is. Homosexuality, when it's listed in the Bible, is not listed as a race. They're trying to pass themselves off as a race of people. And thus we are being discriminated against. Homosexuality is not a race. It is a reproach. It's a sin. They can talk about civil rights all day long, but it's really about moral wrongs. And don't be deceived about that. Well, bigots and hateful people oppose homosexuality. Again, this is one of their arguments. Thus, if anybody stands up and preaches the truth, now they become a bigot. Now they become hateful. Go back and look at Romans 1. And I want you to specifically look at tonight, verse 30. Do you know what it says about those people? 
listed there. It's talking about the Gentile world and how far they went into sin and depravity because they would not retain God in their knowledge. Do you know what it says? They are haters of God. If you really want to talk about hateful speech, somebody claiming that God created me this way, in this sinful fashion, that is, according to Romans 1 and verse 30, being a hater of God. That is blasphemy in the lowest form. Last but not least, Jesus taught that it was wrong to judge others. This is the catch-all. When you have no defense regarding what you're doing, you just say, judge not lest you be judged. Remember Matthew 7 verses 1 through 5? Jesus did not teach in that context that judging was wrong. Jesus, what he taught there, was who could judge. In John 7 and verse 24, righteous judgment is demanded. Righteous judgment. And so what Jesus is saying in Matthew 7 is not that there's never a time for judgment, that no one should ever judge anybody for anything ever, He's showing that the one with the beam in his own eye, he's not fit to judge the other person with the speck in his eye. The one with greater faults is not fit to judge the one with lesser faults. So what did Jesus say, you hypocrite? First, take the beam out of your own eye. Then you can see clearly enough to remove the speck from your brother. Notice that Jesus is saying, I want righteous judgment to take place. And even the one with the beam, if you remove that beam, now you can see clearly enough to judge and to help your brother. You know, again, this whole idea of, well, you're being so judgmental. It goes back to what we mentioned a moment ago. We're not trying to please humanity. We love humanity. All mankind, we're trying to save humanity. Those who will not be fair with what the Bible teaches, they're going to meet the same word on the day of judgment once again. John 12, verse 48. As we think about these things seriously, this has become a besetting sin in our society. We can remain silent, we can speak out in favor, but we'd be calling God a liar. We must take a stand. In Judges 19 and verse 30, after the Levites' concubine had been misused terribly, a grievous sin had occurred in Israel. What you're going to find at the end of Judges 19 is consider it, take counsel, and speak up. That's what we need to do as Christians, as brothers and sisters in Christ. Regarding anything the Bible teaches, we need to consider it. We need to take counsel with the Word of God, and we need to speak up so that people are not lost in their sin, and they don't even know because of society that they're sinning against God Almighty. Let's have the courage to do what is right, to preach what is right, and let's have the wisdom for ourselves to be the kind of example that will help others come out of sin, just as all of us did, and come to Jesus for salvation. Tonight, if you need to respond to the invitation of Jesus Christ, let's not hesitate, let's not procrastinate, don't put it off. Let's do the Father's will and come right now, while together we stand and as we sing.
Everyone would please pass for attendance cards to interior halls and to be picked up. I'd like to thank Ken for this series of lessons that he's had on this uncomfortable subject. It's uncomfortable to listen to, it's uncomfortable to teach about, but we are to speak out against sin, and homosexuality is sin. It's abomination, it's detestable, it's disgusting, and God wants us to speak out against sin, and we thank you, Ken, for your lessons on this. We would like to extend a special invitation to our visitors to stay for a little while and let us get to know you and you get to know us. I'd like to thank everyone for being here this evening. I invite everyone this even, Wednesday evening for Wednesday evening Bible classes at 7 p.m. And I'd like to ask everyone to please keep each other and keep our shut-ins and our sick on our thoughts and in our prayers. We'll be now led in our closing prayer. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, thank you for this beautiful day that you have blessed us with, that we could come here and study your word and sing praises to thee. Dear Lord, we pray that you would be of the sick of this congregation, Betty Roach, Von Sil Brown, Jared Stephen, Ralph and Ronnie Buchanan. And dear Lord, there's many others that are sick that I have not mentioned. I pray that you be with them too. Then we pray, pray that you be with Rhonda Bell and Polly Savage, the passing of their sister, that you might comfort them as only as you can. Dear Lord, we pray that you bid us we go through the rest of this week and bring us back to the next appointed time. In Christ's name, amen.